Hey guys, what's up? It's Clay. Welcome back to another video. Thanks for joining me today, whether you're listening on the video or you're listening on the podcast. I'm glad you're here. So to live in our culture is to succumb to control. So if you live in a country, and whether or not you agree with that country or not, you will be forced to follow the laws of that country. And within that, there seems to be a couple different types of control. So we've got this direct control, which is you know, things like laws and rules and policies and standards that you must follow. If you don't follow them, there'll be some kind of obvious punishment. So like laws are like that. You might get a fine or go to prison if you don't follow the laws. And then there's this other type of control, like indirect control. And this is more, you know, societies, groups, communities, they kind of form these standards like cultural norms or family values or, you know, community standards. Let's say you're in some kind of community. And these are the guidelines that you're expected to follow. But it's not the same as a law. If you break the rule, you're not going to be fined or go to jail, but there will be some other repercussion. So that could be a negative repercussion, like we're going to, you know, the group might shame you or that you might get kicked out of something. Or you're, you're not living up to our standards. You can't hang out with us. But control can also come in the form of positive reinforcement. So if you behave in a certain way that the group approves of, you will be rewarded. So we've got these two things, direct and indirect control. And together, it basically creates this blanket of rules over us as we're trying to navigate our lives. You know, one thing I've always found very ironic and very hard to wrap my head around is, you know, people talk about freedom. You know, well, in this country, we live in a free country. And I, I'm always a little confused because I say, well, you know, we're, we're sort of free, like we're half free. You know, we have to do all kinds of stuff. So we're not free in that area. Like, for example, if I grow some apples and my neighbor grows some oranges and we want to trade, technically speaking, that's income. If I give my apples away and I get some value in return, I've just made income and now I have to give the government some money, income tax. If I don't do that, I will be fined or put in jail, depending on the severity of it all. But it's hard to argue that we have complete freedom, but in many other ways, we do have a lot of freedom. We can choose what we want to do with our time. Um, we can kind of go through life navigating in a, in a somewhat free way. And, and really what I've realized is that freedom is more like a spectrum. It's not a yes or a no. A lot of people are like, yes, I have freedom. And then other people are like, no, we don't. The reality is it's a spectrum. Like many things in life, I'm, I'm realizing this more and more that more and more things are spectrums instead of you know, static words. Freedom is a perfect one. You know, is a bird in a cage free, for example? Well, the bird is free within the confines of the cage. And the freedom becomes more obvious the bigger the cage. So if you had a tiny cage this big and the bird barely could even flap its wings, you would be like, that, that bird isn't very free but let's say it had a, a cage the size of this room and it could fly around and it had trees and other birds to hang out with. You know, the bird might even be tricked into thinking it's very free. And you know, what if you keep expanding this cage out? Well, now let's say it's the size of a city. So the bird, you know, can fly around this entire city now and it, maybe it doesn't really want to leave. Maybe if the cage wasn't there, it wouldn't leave anyway. And I think that right there is one of the the biggest ways that we get tricked sometimes. We think we're free because we can do everything we want. We, we don't really want to leave the city. But there's a few people that might want to, and those people now notice the lack of freedom in their life. They're not allowed to leave. And one funny thing that I see all the time is people sort of arguing about all these controls. Um, they're like, well, you know, let's, let's say eating steak was illegal, and you happen to be a vegetarian. Well, you don't really care that much because you didn't eat steak anyway. And there's some underlying hypocrisy, is what I've noticed, in a lot of these issues. A lot of political issues are like this. Nobody likes control when they're the one being controlled. But that same person that doesn't want to be controlled will now turn around and really not care very much if somebody else is being controlled in a way that kind of follows their own values. Let's say you, your religion says that um, gay people shouldn't be married. There's lots of people who think that about their religion. 
um, well, they're not gay. They're not trying to get married. So they're not really negatively affected by this rule, right? But now there's other people out there who are gay and they want to get married. They're going to naturally grind with this rule, with this law that these people are trying to create. All right, so coming back to myself, what I've begun to notice is that in the past, I was very susceptible to all types of control. And I almost couldn't tell the difference and I, between this direct control and this indirect control. Things that I have to follow, like income tax, if I don't pay my income tax, I'm gonna get in big trouble. So maybe I just need to accept that I have to pay it. But a lot of the cultural and societal norms maybe those rules can be bent or broken. If you're a people pleaser, you're even more susceptible to a lot of these things and you're, you're susceptible to shame, that's for sure. And as you go along, people will shame you and you will change your behavior based on you know, how bad the shame is. These two types of control need to be separated and I need to recognize what is a direct form of control and what is an indirect form of control because if you live your life just living under all of this, I think, I mean, at least for me, it's, it's, it kind of, it's like, it's like a weight. Um, it's like this low level depression that can push down on me. And so I want to be able to identify that and sort of get some of my freedom back. So one of my main questions around this topic is why is it so foreign of a concept in our cultures of people having freedom to make their own choices and to make their own opinions. Sounds so simple. And you might even support it on a vague high level when I say that. Should everybody have the right to their own opinion? A lot of people would say yeah. But when it comes down to it, a lot of people spend a lot of their time trying to convince other people that their opinion is the right one rather than just relaxing and allowing people to have different opinions. Like, what is it about us that that is such a foreign concept? Here are all these people, in politics, it's just, it's just, that's what politics is almost. It's trying to control other people. It's trying to make laws to force other people to do stuff. And I'm finding more and more as I go along that it, it just seems more and more crazy as I go. So, you know, maybe I'll throw out some examples here of what I mean. So I'm gonna group these examples I have into two kind of categories. So on one hand, we have laws that might protect me. Let, let's say I'm following a law. It might protect me as a person, but it also might be protecting others from harm. So that's sort of the first type. It's, it's not just for my own sake, it's for other people's sake. But then you have these other laws that are only for my sake. So what's an example of that? like a bicycle helmet law. So where I live, it's actually illegal to ride around on a bicycle without a helmet. You have to wear one. And in a lot of ways, the rationale makes sense, right? It's like, well, if we force everybody to wear a helmet, everybody will be safer. Um, but the thing about it is, if I wear a helmet and I crash, or I don't wear a helmet and I crash, it's not really affecting anybody else. And arguably, you could say it affects the doctors. You know, maybe they'll have less patience. But apart from that, like it's not like it harms anybody else. You know, say like speeding, for example, that might actually harm somebody else. If I'm driving around at really fast, like triple the speed limit, you know, I have a higher chance of crashing into somebody else and hurting somebody. I could crash into another car, I could hit a pedestrian, I could hit a bike. So a law like that is not only protecting you, but it's also protecting other people from being harmed by you. So there's these two kinds of situations. So what are some laws that prevent harm to other people? Well, things like murder. You, you know, let's just say you like to murder for fun. Not saying obviously that I do that, but you know, a psychopath might want to murder for fun. So the laws basically say, no, you're not allowed to go murder people. You're not allowed to murder people if you get angry at them. Um, if someone lips you off or someone, you, someone punches you, like you're not allowed to just kill them in response. So these laws protect people as well as others. So, you know, other things like rape or, you know, even like jaywalking. You know, you're walking across the street where there's no crosswalk. Well, you might cause an accident and harm other people. But the thing that I really want to focus on, though, is all these other rules that don't really seem to affect other people. 
So I already gave the bike helmet example, but what are some other ones? Like seatbelts. Where we live, we have to wear seatbelts. If you don't wear it, you can get a ticket. Um, you know, does it really harm others if you don't wear your seatbelt and you get in an accident? No, it's really just a protection for yourself. You know, this can escalate to things like drug use. Let's say somebody really likes to take cocaine. That's sort of their own decision and they're not really harming other people. Obviously, if you now commit another crime while on cocaine, that's illegal. But if somebody wants to sit in their own house and take drugs, they're not harming anybody else. They arguably could be harming themselves. So this can escalate into bigger issues. And I don't want to get too political in this, so I'm going to try to stay quite neutral. But you might have like vaccine mandates. Where I lived, you know, they basically said you couldn't go to gyms, you couldn't go to restaurants. There was a time where lots of stuff was shut down. On one hand, the government is trying to protect you and saying, we want you to get a vaccine. We think you're going to be safer. So we're going to force you to do that. On the other hand, it might be protecting people around you. Um, you know, I guess people argue about that, whether it actually is protecting other people or not from being infected. Some people say yes, some people say no, and even the data when I try to read it, it's, it doesn't really seem clear. But that's not really the point that I'm trying to make. The point is we're making rules that force people to do things with their own body. So you have a body and we're going to actually take away your free choice and force you to get this vaccine. So what are some other examples? Things like relationships, marriage, romantic relationships in general. There's a lot of rules. So this, is, this is more of an example of indirect control, right? Culture will tell you how you're supposed to behave in a romantic relationship. There's all kinds of rules, right? And if you don't do the right things or you do the wrong things, oftentimes there's a lot of shame, guilt uh, placed upon you. And, you know, for the record, I'm not saying that this is a bad thing. I think I'm just going through the process of recognizing a lot of these things on my life. So what's a more extreme example of control and a more debated issue? You know, I hesitate even talking about it, but, you know, why not? Um, abortion. So this is a really hot topic. I feel like it's less of an issue up here in Canada. Like, there's not a lot of people that are trying to petition the government um, to prevent people from having an abortion. But down in the United States, obviously, um, and we receive a lot of our media and stuff from the United States. Obviously, this is a massive issue. And I feel like this issue is a perfect case study. It's, it's extremely fascinating to me because it illustrates the idea perfectly. So let's say you've got Bob over here, and he is very against abortion. And you've got, here's a, a girl, let's say she gets raped. She now is pregnant. So let's say she's young, 13 years old. She doesn't feel prepared to have a baby. Let's say there's some medical risks associated with it. I don't know. So she might feel, you know, in the confines of that nuanced situation that she would like to have an abortion. And then you've got Bob over here who wants to prevent this situation from happening. And normally it's associated with Bob's own morals and values and his feeling that his morals and values are the right one and that that should be imposed onto the rest of society. So it kind of goes back to my original observation that opinions, I mean, really, what, what are morals and values? They're kind of opinions. They're your own opinions. And these things form up and get stronger and stronger over time, and they become values. And I think people get confused between truth and an opinion a lot of the time. Um, especially in religious contexts, you know, you're kind of taught. It's not an opinion. It, you're not... It's almost like they don't really teach the difference between belief and knowing. If, if, if it's a belief, it is the truth. I don't want to get too deep into that. I've talked about that in other videos, but it's, it's a funny thing to me that you would call it a belief, which essentially means that you don't know. But you were going to treat it as if you know, and now you're going to try to force that on the other people with laws. I think the most fascinating thing about this for me is the control that Bob is willing to issue over another person and the moral response that that control itself is a moral thing. Because what, what is Bob really trying to do? So here's this 13-year-old that was raped. So Bob comes along and says, you can't have an abortion. You must carry that baby to term. So regardless of whether I would have an abortion or not, the point is, is that Sally doesn't think it's wrong in that 
situation. If she is now forced to carry that baby to term, let's say for eight months she is now turned into a human incubator by force. My question is, is that slavery? Um, she's doing something against her will. The government is forcing her to basically do work, uh, commit time. You know, what is the difference, I guess, is my question, between that and slavery? And I find it interesting how Bob over here wouldn't actually see it as slavery. It's almost like we have this cultural indoctrination or cultural brainwashing that says it's actually good to control people to the point of slavery. We want to create laws that make people do things that they don't want to do under the threat of punishment, which is essentially slavery on a sliding scale. And really at the end of the day, I wonder, there, there's something going on with us human beings here. It's this inability to separate your own opinion and your own morals and your own beliefs of what is right from the act of forcing other people to believe as you do. It's almost like culturally accepted, and, and worse than that, culturally expected, that if you have a belief or a moral, that you force that onto other people. And really the question I'm asking myself is, why is it my job to force that person to protect themselves? If they want to take a drug, if they want to ride around on a bike like a lunatic, if they want to do an extreme sport that only affects them, what does that have to do with me? And what kind of world has decided that it is my job to now have an opinion on this. Yes. So I was listening to Michael Malice. If you haven't listened to him, he is all about anarchy. So, you know, he's kind of a polarizing individual and I kind of went on this binge for a while listening to a whole bunch of interviews with him to try to absorb and understand his viewpoint. Um, it was really interesting. You know, anarchy is a lot different than kind of the idea I had in my head. You know, there's always two sides to every story, right? There's the, like, our culture kind of defines anarchy in this, like, oh, people who just want chaos and murder and theft everywhere, everybody, everybody for themselves, right? That's almost, like, what anarchy kind of means to me, like, before I did any research on this. But what it actually means is quite surprising. It, it really just means a single thing, and it means everybody has the right to make their own decisions. Everybody has the right to opt into a system or opt out. For example, um, if you don't have a car and you're never going to drive on the roads, then you can opt out and not pay for roads. In our culture, obviously, a lot of our taxes go to all these different things, and you're not allowed to opt in or out. You're kind of opted in by force. It seems like anarchy kind of views the government almost no different than like a mafia shakedown. Let's say you got a corner store and once a month this mafia guy comes in and says, give us our cut or we're going to hurt you. There's a request or a demand, and then there's a negative repercussion. So the anarchists say, what's the difference between what the government does? They just do it in a, a more ordered way, but they're basically saying, give us our cut, give us our money, or we're gonna throw you in jail. I actually have got to the point where I can't really see the difference. The only difference between the mafia and the government is their intentions and whether you align with their vision. If you really supported the mafia, well then maybe they just essentially are a government. I've been thinking about all the things that I'm not allowed to opt out of. And then it comes back to this freedom issue and it's like, well, am I free? I think the answer to that question is, I'm not. I'm, I'm half free. But is half free free? I would say no. Free really does mean you're allowed to do what you want, and I'm not allowed. Um, both under these direct government rules, but also all these indirect cultural norms. And if you don't do what they say, there's gonna be negative repercussions for you. Or positive repercussions will be removed. So yeah, anarchy, it's funny, it's been a really interesting topic to me. And much to my surprise, anarchists still support order, they still support systems, but rather than being forced into a single option, they just want choice. So rather than having, you know, this one police force that's 
handled by the government. There's maybe no checks and balances. What if you just don't like the police? It seems like there's a lot of people that don't like the police. Well, in an anarchist society, if this private security firm that the community has hired to provide security isn't doing a good job, then they get fired. Or let's say there's other choices out there and now they can hire a different security firm. And the reality is, is that's the basis of a free market, right? So in a free market, people have choice. They can buy this thing or there's another brand of the same thing. And it's the competition that makes the product better, right? If there was only one type of car and there was no competition, you can kind of bet that there's not going to be any innovation and it's probably just going to be a crappy car. But because there's lots of different choices and people have choices, now it creates competition and spurs innovation. So kind of the, the basis of anarchy is the same idea, but it takes that concept and spreads it to everything. So everything is a choice. Everything is an opt-in, opt-out. And the thing that I find fascinating about it is that the underlying belief is that everybody has the right to make their own choice and form their own opinion. And there should never be a situation where you are forcing other people to do things against their will unless they are harming others. And then maybe you do want to stop it, stop them or prevent them from doing that, right? Um, as a community, you can still get together and make rules and say, what? You know what? Murder's illegal. Rape is illegal. And anybody that does that will have this punishment. And the community can kind of decide that. Um, but I think what I thought was interesting about it is that these things are very flexible and more open for debate. Um, so one thing that Michael Malice said one time that I thought was really interesting was, um, you know, people think that anarchy is bad or won't work, but he points out that many relationships in the world are anarchist. So the way that countries relate to each other, they have an anarchy relationship. Say you've got the United States and China. Neither one is controlling the other. They're not telling the other what to do. They kind of cooperate and negotiate and they might have, they might bump heads now and then, but at the end of the day, they have an anarchist relationship. There is no world government telling both of them what they can or can't do. A lot of times, People, individual people in communities have anarchist relationships. Let's say, hey, how about you come over here and we'll record a video together. Um, there's no government that's saying that person has to do that or what the rules are. These two people get together and they define you know, the rules on that relationship. If it works out, then they both can benefit. If it doesn't work out, then they can dissolve that partnership. I've begun to wonder like, hmm, this, this core concept of not controlling other people really aligns with my own values. I, I, even if I disagree with the person, I don't know if I want to prevent them from doing what they want to do. So as a last section of this video, I thought I would give some ideas of, you know, what has created this situation that we're in? Why do we feel so justified in trying to force other people to do things that they don't want to do? And I, I wonder if it all comes down to the religious underpinning of our cultures. It does seem like there's this obsession on behalf of most religious people, whatever religion that is. Let's take Muslims or Christians or any other one. There's a lot of obsession, I find, on forcing the morals of that religion on other people. So you see this a lot in the Middle East. You've got these religious governments that are now enforcing Islamic law onto the population, even if they're not Muslims. So as an example, you know, in certain Muslim countries, women are expected to behave a certain way. They may have to wear, you know, coverings over their faces. Maybe they won't be allowed to go to school. And why is all this stuff happening? Well, it all comes back to an interpretation of the religion. It seems like not all Muslims believe that, but the ones who are in power do. So in North America, Europe, kind of Western culture, it's Christianity that's underpinning a lot of these things. But it's the same type of thing. I, I, you know, there's this idea of separation of church and state. And a lot of Christians actually really like that idea. And they 
They support the separation of Christian church and state. Christians or churches will often be quite adamant about separation of church and state when the government is trying to meddle in the church's business. It's like, hey, stop meddling, separation of church and state, leave us alone. However, that will completely flip around when the church now has some opinions on how to meddle in the government. So the abortion situation is a perfect example. I think really the reason why this particular topic and this issue will never be resolved, I actually honestly believe that, it will never be resolved. So the religious belief being that life begins at conception. Even a one day old fertilized egg is a life, right? Other people will say, no, obviously, a one day old fertilized egg is not a human being yet. and so. These two people will argue about where life starts and they try to create this line, right? But, you know, the funny thing about this to me is I think that really we need to stop having the discussion and just accept that these people over here believe this thing, these people over here believe this, and both these people need to stop trying to control the other people and accept that different beliefs exist, different opinions exist. As an aside, I think one of the funniest things that I heard a Christian say recently, you know, they said life begins at conception. And then I said, well, what about fertility treatments? They go and they fertilize a bunch of eggs. So they put a number of them in, knowing that a few of them won't work or a number of them won't work. And oftentimes they have a few left over of these fertilized eggs, and then they might throw them out afterwards. And I'm like, well, if you believe life begins at conception, is fertility treatment wrong? I think the reality is, is that life is very nuanced and we try to make these hard, fast rules. I think that's one of the biggest tragedies of our culture and that's the problem with laws is that they kind of force nuanced situations into one issue and oftentimes they're just not. So like I was saying, Christians sort of support separation of church and state quite often because they don't want the state meddling in their affairs, but then they have no problem trying to petition the state to create laws to meddle in other people's lives. So abortion's one thing, or even as simple as like gay marriage. There's, there's lots of people in the United States. Up here in Canada, I don't think there's anybody really trying to prevent gay people from being married. It seems like in the States, there's very strong opinions about that. They're actively trying to create laws to prevent that. And so this is a, a control. It's an indirect control that they're trying to move into a direct control. People will have these cultural norms and they realize that maybe their shame and their guilt to enforce these cultural norms isn't working any longer. And so as a last ditch effort, they will try to make it into a, a direct control, AKA a law. So yeah, I've, I've noticed this obsession with theists to try to enforce other people's behavior that don't believe with laws. You know, I've wondered why, why are they doing that? You know, it's funny with Christianity, you've got this guy, Jesus, who comes and he was very not interested in government. So if you actually look at some of the stuff he said, like, you know, the, I remember there was one part where the Pharisees, they, they were trying to trick Jesus and they said, you know, should we have to pay taxes to Caesar? And Jesus says, you know, pay to Caesar what is owed to Caesar, but pay God what is owed to God. It's almost saying like, I don't, I don't even care. Like, I don't care about the government or taxes, but what I do care about is the kingdom of God and giving God what he deserves. There's other parts where he said things like, the son of man came to serve, not to be served. So here's this guy that it was almost like he was trying to change things from the bottom up by serving other people. I mean, he was a person who called himself a king on, on one hand, but then he was washing people's feet. You know, Jesus wasn't petitioning the government for new laws or political change or trying to get more rights for the Jews under Roman occupation. Like, he literally didn't care. He basically just seemed to ignore the government altogether. It wasn't really his thing. He would have never tried to force a Jewish custom onto the Romans with a law. So I find it extremely interesting, given the context of what Jesus was and what he represented, why Christians in particular are so obsessed with trying to force their morals on the rest of the population. 
I thought the point of accepting Jesus, becoming a Christian, it was all about choice. It's important that you choose it for yourself. You can't force somebody to become a Christian. So why are, why are they trying to make laws that force people to behave or to appear more Christian? I think ultimately it's a very selfish thing. It's saying, I'm more comfortable if everybody else is more Christian. You know, it's interesting, there's stuff in the Bible, Jesus said, you're supposed to set yourself apart. And so the more, the more different culture is, the more obvious it is that you're not part of culture, right? The more obvious that you are countercultural as a Christian. But if a Christian can make the rest of culture look very Christian, then they don't really have to do much to set themselves apart. They can almost just fit right into culture, be really lazy about it and not do anything and still be Christian. I'm, I'm getting to this point where people ask me what my beliefs are. What, what is my political ideology? I think my political ideology, if I had to have one, is that everybody should have the right to think what they want. Everybody should have the right to their own opinion. And people shouldn't be forced to do things that are against their will. Because at the end of the day, I'm realizing that I don't want to be controlled. I, I'm getting a little angsty about it, to be honest. As, I, you know, as I've been thinking about this so much, I'm starting to see the control everywhere. I'm really asking myself lately, like, how do I know if I'm even doing something out of my own decision, my own rationality, my own lot? logic? How do I know if I've have actually made the decision to do this or if I'm just so programmed by culture to do that thing and I'm just telling myself that I'm making that choice? This is a really hard thing for me lately. I guess it all, go, all goes back to the free will. I have another video on free will if you want to go check it out. Do we have free will or Am I just programmed, and when I think I'm making a decision, I'm more just observing my decision rather than making that decision itself? You know, where do thoughts come from? Things just come into my head. I didn't decide to put that in my head. I didn't think to think something before I think it. So I realize that's pretty cryptic and complicated to think about. But at the end of the day, I'm trying to strip apart my own will if I even have it, from the control that's been placed upon me. Because I honestly believe that if you do something under the threat of punishment, or you're doing something out of a state of control, that it's not real. And so like in relationships especially, I want somebody to be choosing me, not because they're forced to, or society tells them that they have to do things. I want it because they want it. And it's like that old Alan Watts quote, if you hold your breath, you will lose your breath. You have to breathe out in order for the breath to come back. And I feel like a lot of control is almost the same thing as holding your breath. So you get a relationship and then the breath is held. I am trying to figure out how to live without the control, which of course is difficult because I live in a culture and a world that is so full of control. And so I'm, I'm starting or trying to see it all like a game. When you play a game, there are rules, and you can play the game given those rules. It's how I'm trying to see the world. And I'm trying to think outside the system, but play within it, if that makes sense. Anyway, guys, a whole bunch of thoughts, a whole bunch of ideas, all jammed into that one video. Um, a lot of it's not perfectly formulated yet, but just some things that I'm working through. So if you have any questions about any of this, feel free to let me know. Leave a comment or uh, leave an audio question, and uh, I'd love to hear from you. Okay, have a good day. See ya.